we're kind of in the part of the course where we can just do what the heck we want. I mean, we, um, you know, if there's things you want to do or talk about. I think people had talked about principal agent stuff, so I was going to talk about that today a little bit. Incentives. There are a lot of things I can talk about. I'm happy to talk about. Um, a lot of fun things to do. So let me know if you have a particular preference or anything like that. Okay, let's see. Okay. Let's see. Is this moving? Oh, good, okay. All right. All right, let me see. What I want to talk about is... Um, principal agent stuff. It'll be based on this paper, which I wrote. Um, where is it? Down here, okay. This is like the first paper, it won't be the second paper I wrote when I was a graduate student. This is, uh, um, it's, uh, I was taking this class on slavery and economic history. And one of the biggest issues historically is like why slavery went away. Like, at the time, there were a lot of um, anti-slavery folks who said that as an institution, it was just economically ir irrational, like it didn't make money and it was something which would automatically go away just by the forces of you know, technology and all that. But actually, people have gone back and found that actually it was extremely profitable even during the end. So it really was, you know, when the people in the South wanted to keep slavery in the United States, they did it for reasons. It wasn't just like their way of life. They made a ton of money doing it. So even at the very end, I mean, so there's all these... This, these things like how how it was rational, how how was it kind of profitable, how was it um, did it sustain itself for so long, and and so one of the issues there is um, for many people it came down to the issue kind of of what can you do in slavery which you can't do otherwise. That was kind of the thing. And obviously the the answer is you can uh, use violence. That's as a really so so a lot of there's a fair amount of work about how to think about violence in labor relationships, and um, still I think this is a very much under studied concept because if you look at human history, I mean, there's been at least as much work under the threat of violence as there has been work under the under wages, for example, right? So, you know, wage labor is a relatively new thing, like for the last 200, 300 years. And so, so it's, I think it's interesting. So I came across, so I took this economic history class and someone said, oh, you know, there's somebody who's working on pain as an incentive, like violence. So I thought, oh, well, I'm taking a class on incentives. Let me see if I can adjust that adapt that model. So it was a really straightforward kind of adaptation of a model. It's a classic kind of thing, technique where you, you just take an existing model and just change it in a small way. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is talk about this in the general context of how we think about incentives and, and in general ways. I guess it applies to political things too. Okay, so if you're going to like think about how, let me make sure I'm recording, how to model giving people incentives, how would you model that? Let's see, okay. How would you think about that? Let's say that you're trying to ask somebody, um, we're gonna model like you getting someone to, I don't know, I don't know, like, you know, put together a piece of IKEA furniture or something like that, square or something like that. How does that work? I mean, how do, we, how do I model that? Or, or the other thing, another thing is like, what, what kind of things do you think the model should say? I mean, the payoff should probably differ. Right. Yeah, you know, depending on. Yeah, obviously, right. Exactly. Right. So there's a reason, like, if, if you ask somebody to, uh, you know, there's a reason why task rabbit, like, putting together IKEA furniture is probably a little less than, like, fixing your car or something like that, or, like, I don't know, taking your, you know, taking care of your dog for a week or something like that. But the payment obviously depends on what. The way, I mean, yeah, it's. But, I mean, the value of the service? Yeah, the value of the service. Sense, depends, yeah. But, like, also depends on kind of, like, how much work it is, right? How much whether a person is willing to do it, right? Some, even if something's very small amount of work, if it's something just very undesirable, you know, um, then somebody's you know you have to pay them more to do it, right? So it's, how kind, of, it's kind of the same thing though, no? like oh, assuming maybe. that people are similar enough, like that's just directly proportional to. Well, I know, like yeah, yeah. There's some things that are uncomfortable, but they're not hard work. Like, like uh, for example, like I read that like um, if you want to work in the mortuary business, it's hundred percent employment, like. People just don't want to do that for all these reasons. But it's sure. not like it's sure. just really like crazily hard, I'm not sure. So um, you know, there's a like <laughs> there's like on the flip side is that that is like, can you make money operating a, a coffee shop? And the story is that very few people make money operating coffee shops because um, because everybody wants to make everyone thinks it's fun to have a coffee shop, so therefore 
it's like kind of the opposite of being like a mortuary. You see, it's like people are actually, you almost have to pay them, you know, they're going to pay to be like a coffee shop owner or something like that. Okay. All right, so how do I model this? I guess if I lose the lock, I guess that's what happens. Okay. All right, so how do I model this? First of all, remember players' actions pay off. Wait, what are the players? First, providing the service, and then yeah, exactly. buying, buying kind of, a buyer seller, I guess. Exactly, kind of like a buyer seller who's buying, you know, who's making the offer. So, in this terminology, which came actually originally from insurance, well, you can just write that have the employer or employee. Employee. And um, from insurance, it came to this idea of principal, which is kind of a boss or agent. Okay, that's kind of the idea. So that's where principal agent comes from. I think it's from insurance or something like that. Um, okay, so what are the actions? Pay, don't pay, and yeah. then work, don't work. Yeah, exactly. So the principal kind of offers something, right? right. So you can think of like principal. And it's, it happens in time. A principal makes some sort of offer. And then maybe the, uh, the employer or agent does it or not. It, I guess accepts. Or does it, John? I don't know. I think it does it. Or not. Like you put on, you know, cash grab that I want somebody to like fix my IKEA furniture for $20. You put that out there, and somebody sees it, and then decides whether to take it or not. Okay. So what would go here, for example, if the agent doesn't? So, sorry, just to be clear. Yeah. They don't take the payment when they don't. Yeah, right, exactly. I mean, by not meeting, they just uh, no, no deal or something. They not doing can take it and run kind of thing. Right? Yeah, exactly, right. Okay. Not sure. You might say there's another branch as well. If they do the job, then the... the Principal gets you to actually pay or not pay or something. We're talking about our former president. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so if not accept, I think it's sort of like zero zero. Isn't it? So no counter off. No, no. No, no, no you know, exactly. yeah. So yeah. I don't think like, well, you know, you could bottle that. That's what we did last time. Yeah. Like a back, back and forth kind of thing. You could bargain, of course, but that's just sort of keep it simple. You might test grab whatever. I don't know if the test coverage folks go back and say, hey, over here. <laughs> maybe you could. All right, but if the agent does a job, what goes in here? So it probably be whatever the cost is plus the value of the job, something like that. Right, right, right. So for the principal, what are the, the payoffs here? The, the utility from the thing being done minus the payments. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's the benefit of jobs. It's okay to write this in some words. It's also, I don't know, it's a completion or something. <laughs> but minus what? Whatever they do. Yeah, which at the payment money is like, like a wage of payment or something. And what's the, uh, the agents? Yeah. Value of the payment minus whatever the kind of cost of doing the Yeah, job exactly is. right. So that they can get that by payment. Like minus kind of effort or something like that. Or expenses or something like that. Yeah. Okay, so um, it's not that hard. So how do we think about this? Say that the payment, I don't know, so say that, I don't know. Um, uh, let's see, so say the benefit to the, you know, it's worth like $30 for your uh, IKEA furniture to be completed. Okay, and say the, the um, it, I don't know, the effort, what do you want to say the effort of completing this job is? I don't know, 10 or something? 10, 15. 10, 15. What do you think is going to happen? We, do, we can just do sub perfection. So if you're the agent, if the effort is 10, if you don't accept it, it's zero. So you will it does you do the job as long as the payment is worth. Above. Yeah, it's 10 exactly about right? 10 or above. Okay. So if you're the principal, then what offer will you make? Ten dollars. Ten dollars. It's pretty straightforward, right? So you'll get 20 the percent of zero. That's it. No big deal. All right. Um, what if the effort goes up? Nothing goes on. That's going to make sense, right? 
that means like you would if if it's more it takes more effort, you have to pay them more. Okay, what if the effort is like this? I guess we have to bring the principle do not offer as well. What if you have this 40 with the benefit? Yeah, there's no offer, right? To make the person do it, you have to give them this 40, but that gives you 30 minus 40, so I guess you'd rather just. That sort of makes sense too, right? There are certain things which, if you could ask somebody to do something, but the amount they would take you, they would, the amount they require for them to get it, do, do it is more than it's worth it to you. That right? doesn't make sense. Like, I don't know, for example, you might ask somebody to, um, I don't know, I don't know, like, go through your kindergarten folders or something like that. No, that would like, take a lot of, like, very extraneous stuff in their part. They would only cost a thousand dollars. It's not really worth it to you to do that. So it's that, that kind of deal with them. I don't think it's free. So this is, this model is, the model almost all economic relationships. It's pretty safe. It's almost so, so direct that you don't even think about it. Okay, but it, it makes sense. It does kind of have nice things. However, there are obvious problems with it. It doesn't kind of direction of the world. Um, let's see, what are the obvious problems? What do you like the, seller, the, the seller has an incentive to... Um, so we'll start with one. The, the agent has an incentive to, um, to signal that there's a higher level of effort, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, he's like, so one of the issues is um, maybe the agent, even if, if the effort is um, 20, this is kind of like we do with emergency stuff, right? But the, the agent says, well, actually, it's really, you know, I'm really having a hard time today. It's really hard work. You know, actually, it's worth, you know, I'm not, I'm going to do it, I won't do it for 20, I'll do it for 30. Mm -hmm. The agent wants to run this right. So how does the principal do that? And you can say it the other way around, right? Maybe the, the, the agent doesn't know how much the principal cares. Or maybe the principal says, well, you know, the most I can spend is 20 dollars, even though the principal would want to spend 40 dollars. So that's an issue. So that's definitely an issue. Um, there's another issue. I think you already mentioned before, which is that once this happened, Maybe the uh, principal doesn't want to be negative paying the money. You know, that's kind of a simple as we call it a hold-up problem or something. You can ask somebody to do something. Um, see that, I don't know, like, I bring my, my car to the shop. Um, I ask them to fix, fix it, and then they'll fix it and come back and they'll just drive off the car. You know, that's why they keep the car, right? And the keys, yeah. Exactly, right. That's why they can do a means and that kind of thing. Sometimes you split up, split the cost up in half and half. And Okay, so that's, those are all problems. Okay. In the particular case of um, violence and labor issue relationships, however, there's even a deeper, kind of, even more fundamental, well, not more fundamental, but also another problem. Okay. Which is something like this. Um, say that in, you know, and this is, I guess, is true for power type relationships too. Say that um, you can, this is just a matter, like, we're basically saying is you can't make somebody worse. Right in this model, right? You can only offer them something, and if, you, and if they don't take it, it's good to do this. But say you can actually make them worse. You know, you can say to them, okay, well, um, I'm going to ask you to do this job, and if you don't do my, you know, furniture, I'm going to go over and rob your house or something like that. Sure. Okay. All right, so how would that, that end up? How would that change the model? So instead of does not exist, there's some kind of like, Violence is occurred and then the chaos becomes negative, right? Yeah, exactly. It's something like do not accept this could be negative for you, right? right. Exactly. Like, say that you know I can make this minus ten. In this case, like you might do the effort even yeah. when you get a thing that's right. Right. Yeah. It's the yeah, the the benefit of having that not happen. Right, exactly. So, okay, so that's not that that's something reasonable too, right? If you can make somebody worse off by not doing it, then you don't have to pay them so much and so right. Okay. But then kind of there's a conundrum which is a little bit like this. Which is, why don't I just make this, if I can make you really badly off, why don't I just go around saying, hey, you know, make me dinner, otherwise I'm going to, you know, go to your house. It's not credible. It's not credible, right? There's this negative thing, right? And why is it not credible? Because you run the risk of yeah. something bad happening to you, which probably yeah, exactly, is the right. benefit of, or the cost of, of paying the person. Right, exactly. So there has to be, a, there's often a cost for doing this thing, right? So that's kind of the essence of uh, um, violence in some sense. It's costly for everybody. Like that's when I, in this model, when I talk about it, that's the difference between a fine and violence, or what I call pain. Like, what does it mean to give somebody pain? It makes the person worse off, but it's different from fining them because if you find them, it makes them worse off, but it actually makes you better off. It's 
to me, what giving pain means is it makes everybody more soft. It's actually cool to me. So um, there's a cost here as well. All right. Another way to say this is, if you can make people worse off, then, and we just sort of take that as given, right? Then there's a cost behind it, right? Things like this. How does that cost come into play? Actually, for example, say, say it's not as much as like a goal <coughs> you have to say like, you know, if you don't give me a good performance valuation, or like maybe I'll leave, you know, gossip about you to the local newspapers. It doesn't have to be so. Or like in the context of, what about the context of slavery? It's like, you know, I'll ask you to do something. If you don't do it, you know, you know, uh, you'll get whipped or something like that. I mean, it's costly. How does that costliness kind of manifest itself? I mean, you can imagine that there's some degree of humanity <laughs> among people yeah. that even in this case that they sort of there's an internal intrinsic like right, right, right. soul crushing it, you know. Right. Yeah, but okay. Uh, probably not for a lot of these people. Well, no, I mean, okay, this, even even for some purely like say that you assume inhumanity, you know, it's sure. Just, or just say that it's it's like a fine. It's just it's not about violence. It's just like you're making you. You could think of this as not as violence, but just like, I don't know, I'll send you a collection agency, which is quite costly for me, but, you know, try to get to you, you know, make you worse off than you are off this collection agency. Or just, you know, refer you to some, you know, some other good or Okay, but the idea is kind of like, but first of all, one thing is that if you can really give people negative things, then what's keeping you from doing anything, basically, right? And it's because there's some possibility of pushback. Okay, but what is that possibility of pushback? Okay. If you think you'll get the pushback all the time, will you ever do it? No, right? But what if you get the pushback none of the time? Like choosing a level in which it's like below the benefit or? Well, like, so say you get the pushback, like, none, never. So I like you literally go around saying, hey, I have a gun in my pocket. If you go and come for lunch for free, I'm just going to shoot myself at you. What's keeping you from doing that? Or not myself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that might be effective too, but... Well, right, exactly. If there's literally zero, zero pushback, you can just go around doing anything, right? So that's clearly not the case in even in very equal states of like slavery, right? You literally cannot... It's not like you can do literally anything, right? You can't give somebody, like, negative 10,000 utility because it might be costing you. Okay, but what determines that cost? It's obviously not... You don't, you don't get the cost all the time, but you also don't get, get, it, get 0% of the time either. See what I'm saying? Okay. What determines how often you get it? So for example, okay, say I go to one of my employees and say, okay, um, I know you're working hard, um, but if you really were super, super hard, they'll give you a bonus of $1,000. Okay? Will that make them work harder? Probably, yeah. yeah. Not a big deal, right? It's kind of this basic moment before. You can say, like, oh, well, my offer previously was it's really super hard to do this, but if you can make thousand dollars, thousand dollars is more than worth the effort. I'll probably do. It. What if you go to the person and say, "Okay, I know you're working really hard, but if you don't do it I'll by you know, a certain date, I will, um, I don't know, publicly embarrass you or something like that. Something short of that." <laughs> you say that they get priced that in and just work less. Right. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Exactly. So if I use some sort of threat like that, there's a possibility of pushback, right? A thousand dollars is no possibility of pushback. They'll either take it or not. Sure. But if I said something like, you know, if you don't do this, maybe I'll fire you, which is both out here or something like that. Or maybe, you know, I'll make you worse off, or like, I don't know, um, you know, I'll, I'll bad mouth you to other employees or something like that. Something which hurts me and you. Okay? The problem that will take place will depends on what? How large of a negative utility. Yeah, yeah. Like. It depends on a lot of things. It's not zero or one. And in particular, it kind of depends on how well the thread itself works. You see what I'm saying? Like, if I give you this really, really very fierce, like, crazy threat, that might scare you so much that I never actually have to do it. You see what I'm saying? So that's kind of a, a kind of an odd thing about this, right? Sometimes, what keeps you from making very large threats? So sometimes maybe a very large threat might be actually more effective than a, or less costly even than a small threat, because a small threat might, you know, might have to do it, whereas a, a large threat might make you actually really, really work hard and different. When you say small and large, I mean, there's there's at least a couple of dimensions of that, right? Which is mm -hmm. small and large kind of 
in what sense of that? I guess just cost measures, how much hurts you help me. Thank you. Sure. So um let's look at something another another way of writing this point. Okay. When I first was doing this stuff, there's these uh, two uh, economists, one is Robert Vogel, and there's another one, Peter Jangerman. They wrote this um, book called Time on the Cross. It's 1970. So this was um, a book which said for the first time we're going to analyze labor from the point of view of um, sort of modern economics. And they said, how do we, you know, clearly explain that the issue is punishment. That's really one of the key issues of violence. How do you think about violence? What they said was, <coughs> say I can give wages on this side and violence on this side. Okay? And so you've probably seen these things. Maybe the, the, you know, the person, you know, the slave has some sort of thing like this, right? Some sort of what, difference curve. Have you seen things like this before? So what I'll do is I'll choose, choose the, uh, um, I'll figure out what utility I need to make the, the slave do this job. And I'll find a thing on this, this graph which is cheapest to me. Have you seen this kind of stuff before? All right, so they actually wrote this. They're, you know, Vogel has a Nobel Prize. He died. But, you know, they're very, very well economists. He said, this is the, the slave to difference curves. I'll just be fine to think there, which gives me to think of Vogel's cost. Does this make sense? Have you ever done book? This is kind of a thing in war, too. Any political, anything turns to war. So, I, so I, uh, for example, I'll give you this much ways and this much violence, and that'll get you to do thing. Does that make sense to you? Is there a find the right combination to maximize? Right, right, right. So, okay, so for example, if it was like wages and like some other thing, like land <coughs> or something like that, so two kinds of positive things, yeah. it would definitely make sense. Yeah. Right? It would make sense, like, why would anybody want violence, right? Yeah, exactly. So this is all, so different from wages and land, two positive things. It's because, first of all, why would anybody want violence, right? The other way to think about it is that, you know, in some sense, you would never give a combination of wages and violence, right? Because that's give you something plus and something minus. Why don't you just met it out and give them something, just one thing, right? That's another way to think about it. Another way to think about it is the cost of giving violence depends on how well it works. Right? That's the, what I'm trying to get at. The cost of giving a wage does not depend on how well it works. Whereas the cost of violence totally does, right? If you have a very large threat of violence, it might make the person really work hard, and therefore you might have to not do the threat very often. That's the idea. Right? So there's this kind of trade-off. Maybe if I get a small amount of violence, it's cheaper, but I might have to really do it more. Well, it's also like the severity versus the, the likelihood of it being applied, right? Like yeah, exactly. Right. Pieces of it. Yeah. Exactly, right? So, yeah, there's the value of severity and the likelihood of being applied. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, those things are direct. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. the kind of idea, right? Yeah. If I make something very severe, maybe that will actually influence the. Maybe, maybe yeah. that will If they make it super severe, then they will actually be more likely. Yeah. So, right, so even from the point of view, so my decision about what violence to give is not like giving efforts. The logic is actually quite different. If you give if you give a, a positive thing like payment, if it works, you will give it what probably you want. If it with a threat, if it works, you give it probably something between zero and one. Right? And that probability is not, is endogenous. It depends on what the other person chooses to do. Okay? Anyway, so how do I model this? So this is the next thing. So how would you model that? How would you model how threat works for violence or pain? So this is something which the economics profession took like 20 or 30 years to figure out. So don't feel like it's something which is obvious to you. It kind of relates to everything else we've done in the class though already in some sense. Signal, signal. Yeah, some sort of signal thing, right? It's about uncertainty basically. You basically add a little bit of uncertainty, okay? And the idea is that um, sometimes you can hear this term incomplete contracting. You ever heard this term? Maybe I'll open here. What 
what does that mean? It means that if you had a complete contract, you can to do something, say things like, if you do exactly X, Y, and Z, I'll give you $100. If you don't do them, I'll give you zero. And it's a complete contract in the sense that everything you do is observable, and like, so I can see exactly what you've done. Incomplete contracting means there's some f basically fuzziness in this. Like you can say, I will give you like a hundred dollars if it's a good job, but you know I don't really know exactly how much effort you put into that. Like when you go to the dentist, it feels great, but how do you know if they did a good job? You just don't know. Okay. There's some uncertainty involved. Okay, so how would I model that in the simplest possible form? So some uncertainty, right? Some. Why don't you think about that? Just so I mean, you you have you have. I mean, this is yeah. I don't, I don't know. Uh, one version is you can have payoffs that occur with like some probability. So like there's a probability. Yeah. You get a payoff of ten. You know, Absolutely. Eight, et cetera. Yeah. Exactly. So that's a proposed deal of taking, which is that effort itself is like some number, but what effort changes is like the probability distribution over outcome. Okay. So with effort, like it doesn't choose any, it doesn't create anything probably one. So like if my dentist is really good, they'll give, you know, they'll do a 99% chance of success, but still 1% possibility that there'll be an abscess or something. Like if, so let's say if something goes wrong with my root canal and it gets infected, is it a bad my dentist bad or is it just some random thing? I don't know, right? But clearly a better dentist would have a lower probability than worse dentist, or if my dentist really tried hard. So the idea is that effort. Um, I guess the A by the agent, I guess it's the agent times. A separate. Um, changes the probability of outcomes. Okay. And it's sometimes called incomplete contracting because you can't observe the agent's effort directly. Okay, so I go to my dentist, I can't really observe directly whether that person's working hard or you know, checking their phone or something. Okay, I can only check whether my tooth is okay. So if I were able to, to, to observe it directly, then I could just give a month, like, pay my face, I could just, just like, you know, do this amount of effort and I'll be a box and okay. So the idea is that many, many um, situations, you cannot observe things clearly. A lot of things in political science that work like this, you don't really, you know, like you say, oh, I'll, I'll give you, a, you know, five billion dollars if you dismantle your nuclear weapons, but you know, how do I really know that? It's, 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 the agents have to change the probability of outcomes. Okay. So this is so-called incomplete contracting because if it's complete contract, you can contract directly on effort. You can make this conditional effort. It's incomplete meaning you can't, you don't observe the effort directly. You can only um, give people incentives based on the probabilities. It's sort of based on some probabilistic. Okay, how would I model this? I mean, if you do it in like maybe the two worlds, right, where mm -hmm. they do with like maximum effort, little effort, but they just can't, they have an yeah, information yeah, yeah. set. Exactly, so you could, yeah. So what's the information service like, you know, you can't see the effort directly. So what I'm gonna say is say that the effort will measure, the simplest ways of what's, what are the outcomes gonna be like? So I can say this like, I don't know, the good outcome, Okay. Bad outcome. And I'm going to simply say that the probability of the good outcome is A, this is my effort. Okay? That's all it is. And then the probability of the bad outcome is one minus C. This is a pretty simple way of saying. So like if I have good effort, that means it's like A is close to one. Bad effort means point is close to point one. Okay. Alright, so this is the thing. So the agent chooses. which is the effort. Okay, all right, so that's pretty straightforward. It's almost the simplest way of having a certain, just two possible. Okay, what else are we gonna put in here? We have a principal and agent. Okay, what is a principal going to do? Reward or not. Huh? Reward or not. Yeah, yeah. Principal offers something like, I'll give you 100 bucks if my treat works out great, and put zero if it doesn't work out. So something, the principal can't do it directly based on A, but can do it on the outcomes. So what I'll say is like, this principal will offer some new G, which is the utility, okay, to the, uh, to 
to the edges, and then you be the back in Okay. Okay. What about what else? What else steps? How about what about the benefit, principal benefits? I'll say something like, this is how much I care about my tooth. <laughs> I'll simply say that this is like one of the good things happens in zero of the It's pretty simple. Okay, let me think. We get it together, close to the model. I'm trying to think of something else. Oh, okay. This is okay. Um, because the offer is realized on the outcome coming on the good outcome, it's conditional on the good yeah, outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. no, so if I choose A, like 0.9, the good happens to follow probably 0.9, okay. that it comes out to so probably 0.1. Okay. All right. So now let's see. What is now, with this framework, what is the principles? So the principles of expected utility. What? So two things happen, right? Yeah. A, the good outcome and the bad outcome. So it's going to be what? A is the probability of the good outcome. Let me get times one. Yeah, times um, C. Oh. oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. A times one looks like one minus A times zero, right? That's the benefit, right? Oh but we forgot something which is um which is what? This is the offer I make. Okay, remember it kind of, it's the benefit of computer job minus pain. Right? Uh, my, no, just a good question. Why is uh, for the principal offer, why is that in like superscript and not so? Oh, I can make it lower. It doesn't matter. Yeah, no, no, okay. just yeah. I'm just trying to think, what did I do with my paper? Let me see. No, no, let me see what I did with my paper. Let's see. Um, sometimes people are really kind of careful about that. What do I have? Uh, I guess it's a, kind of like an econ convention. Kind of puts stuff in self charts unless it's time periods, right? No, I don't know. My favorite is different. There's no real rule. Um, I guess, you know. Sometimes you use self I don't know why you use I don't know. It is confused, it looks like M to the G a little bit, right? Like if we exponent or something. Okay. The, the journal is called the Economic Journal. Yeah, it's a very straightforward title, isn't it? <laughs> it's the Economic Journal. It was a, it's a it's like the new British version of the AER, American okay. Economic View. It's kinda of like the sure. Royal Economic Society. They published Keynes and people like that. Yeah, back in the day. There's a full story. I have a whole story about this paper and how it got me a job. Okay. Well, this is the benefit to the principal, right? Okay. But actually, there's a cost, okay, which I'm going to write down as say that um, if costs, I think I'll go just B e of U. Um, to give agent utility u. Okay. What do I mean by that? So the simplest thing, like e of u, is going to be like minus u. That means like it costs me twenty dollars to give you twenty dollars. Like to make the utility twenty, it costs me. Actually, this is not minus. It's the cost. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. This would be means it really is expensive to give me a million dollars, right? So a like million dollars is like you know, really costly for me. Does that make sense? Does that make sense about it? So um, this is just the cost of it. Okay. So I think instead of the one and zero, it's going to be what? A times one minus. So this is one, right? If a good thing happens, I'm going to pay you what? Uh, UG. UG. So it's going to be E of UG. Makes sense. And this is going to be what? 
Zero, this is how much I get. Zero minus EUV. Yeah. Okay, that's what I get. Makes sense, this is what I get. And it's a little bit different from this over here. This is the back of one because there's uncertainty. There's a problem. See here, this is basically the same thing except A is one, right? If you give the, 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 the incentive, it happens for sure. And it's, this, this, this whole thing doesn't really come to play. It's just, uh, it's just your benefit minus the cost of getting it. Okay. Okay. This is like, what is this? This is if the bad thing happens, like your teeth are bad. And say, still, say you really get mad at your dentist or something like that. You may want to make them work soft. So this is like your cost of getting on the phone and yelling at your dentist, something like that. It's costly for you and your dentist. Well, this is like the pain or like, okay. What's the agent's expect utility? Well, so it's, they get UG with what probability? Right. A1? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so they get A times U, UG, right? Because so the probability A, the, the good thing happens is they get this. And then what else? One minus A times Yeah, one minus A times Okay, there's something else which is, I should put in here though too, which I haven't really put in here. Huh? Yeah, exactly. There's a kind of a disutility of effort too, right? That corresponds to, to this thing here, right? This, if A were 1, we just have UG, right? That's kind of like this. But we also have to have the effort. And I think I'm just going to call that V of A. This is, this is another thing. It'd be um, cost of effort. A to the agent is V of A. Okay, so that's going to be a function. Okay. So actually, we've done pretty well so far. So this is pretty straightforward. All right. Any question about that? So this is actually our model is kind of close to being done. We have what expected the principal's utility is. We have the agent's expected utility. If you think about the game, what actually happens? Who makes the first move? Principle, right? The principle offers like this UG, UV, right? That's the contract, so to speak. And then what does the agent do? Choose A. Okay. They could not, they could, it could be that they just don't do it at all, okay? So that, we'll call that, uh, we'll call that U bar. That's like the so called, have you it's something that's called reservation utility. In my previous example, this was zero. This means if you just sort of I don't do it at all. Okay, and I guess then I will call this out zero or something. Doesn't matter. Okay. If the agent accepts, the agent then makes another choice, which is what? Hey, UG or UB. Right? Well, so UG and UB are what they get. So what the agent controls is their effort level, which is A. So the agent can control well how hard it works with speed. So this is a little bit different from the previous model where you just do it or not. This one, because we're, we say there has to be some uncertainty, the person's effort it checks, affects not the one or zero thing, but the probability. That's a kind of smooth thing. Okay. So accepts and then I guess chooses A. Okay, so the many possible things of A. In depending on the effort level, then that's what the payoffs are going to be. All right. Okay, so let's think about the agent's choice. Okay. So if the agent's expectation is this, the contract will go through if this thing is at least what? The agent will choose this if. Greater than you are. Yeah, this thing has to be greater than you are, right? So. Okay, so we must have, so, this thing is UG. Okay, this 
this thing has to be bigger than the bar. Okay. This is, so they've got to want to do it. Okay. What's another thing which happened? Which happened? Remember the agent's choosing A. So this is the expected utility, right? The agent can actually ch influence this, right? make a change. So, so right, this, this, this constraint means that the, the agent chooses one of these things over this. Right? So which one of these things will the agent choose? We've actually never done this in this class before. The agent will choose the A which does what? Maximize. Yeah, maximizes this number. Right? Okay, so we have. Um, so we just have this and A maximizes. And A maximizes. This number here. Okay, so this, the A which is actually chosen maximizes this, and this number has to be bigger than one. So these things in the principle, so this is the principal agent model, that's it, the end. Okay, this is what, like, I think Bank Holstrom, this is what Paul Bilgram associated with this. They got the Nobel Prize for this too. Um, not that big a deal, you and I could have figured it out. It wasn't like some huge, you know, complex thing, you just kind of think about it for a while, and you're almost, you're almost inevitably you go down this track, right, because you have to, there's this basic model, which is almost, like, trivial, but then you think, okay, to consider things like, you know, violence, or consider things like um, just any kind of uncertainty, like you have to add uncertainty, it has to be there, right? Otherwise, it's kind of not interesting at all. Once you put uncertainty, you think, well, the uncertainty of the situation actually is influenced by the agents themselves, right? Like, whether, you know, I have to, like, I don't know, if I give a very large payment, the, pro the probability that, that I'll have to give it does depend on the agent's effort. Okay? So then, since the agent can actually, if, they, if, they, if the result is probabilistic, the agent changes the probability. So that effort must be related to the probability, and therefore you kind of led in this direction. Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward. When I first read this, I was like, what's going on here? But now you, you think about it, you kind of hear how it must have to do this. It's a very natural model. Okay, so there's actually names for this. Um, this is called the, um, um, let's see, this thing, the A max is just is called incentive compatibility. Which is this A here actually, when I'm acting this A, this A actually maximizes this thing. Instead of compatible, it's just a kind of a catchphrase of saying people do what they're supposed to do. We're not, the A which is chosen is in their interest. Every, everything which is happy we see is, is in that person's interest. I guess it's kind of like sequential rationality, okay? or just even subgate perfection. This thing here is sometimes called the participation constraint. What this means is that this A must be maximal, that's this thing, but also in the end it has to be bigger than this U bar. Okay, so um, not only is this U thing, this A choice to maximize my expectability, but that expected utility maximization, that result must be better than what I could have done by simply not being there at all, just to reject the whole thing. Okay, so in the end, this is the model, okay? The way we'll go with this. What does the principle do? What are the principle's actions? That's coming out of the model. What does the principle choose? Yeah, exactly. So the principle chooses. What is the offer? UG. Yeah, UG and UB, right? UG and UB. To what? What do they want to do with this? Yeah, they want to make it. Oh, good, maximize, right? Yeah, sorry, yeah. This is the perfect thing. To maximize, this is your... So this is what you're right. Yes. Yeah, maximize. They want to maximize this. Okay. Such that... Such that... We have these two constraints. This number has to be bigger than the bar. Precise constraint. And the A must maximize this thing. This is the model right here. Okay, this is it. 
Do we also have to say that that has to be created by Well, that's a good question. Yeah, well, I, I guess not. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, when I think, but I guess you could put it, that, I, I wrote it down here, right, exactly, if you took this part seriously. Yeah, I guess, yeah. I'll just leave this out. <laughs> I guess you could put that in the thing. It doesn't change things that much. Because if it wasn't, you could always like it enough. Make this one at 100 or something like that. You could scale the whole thing up. OK, anyway, this is the model. When I first thought about this, I think, what the heck is going on? But it sort of makes sense. Right? If there was no, OK, so how could I change it? If the person had no alternatives at all, like literally their U bar is like minus 15,000 or something like that, then this constraint would not be there. This is like if you're employed, like it literally has no other options or something. Okay. Um, but this one I think makes sense, right? The employee chooses an effort. It depends on the UG and UB. It depends on their VA and their A maximum. Okay, that makes sense. Well, so some things how you can motivate it. Let's see if I can put it on my thing. Okay, so look. Okay, what am I doing? In my paper, I said there's a good and bad outcome. This is like money and pain. You can give money and pain, and the good thing and money and pain and the bad thing. But um, and the cost of giving money and pain is getting like this. But the first thing you realize is something you said earlier, which is, would you ever give out five dollars of money and like a little bit of pain? You would never do that because what? Well, that's like wasting money. Right? You're giving the plus thing and a minus thing. You might as well just give them whatever the net thing is. Right? So very quickly you realize you never give mg positive and pg positive. One of these things is going to be zero. Okay. So um, so then when you think about it is thinking about does, giving. Does that rest on any assumptions about? I mean, it probably does. Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah, it rests on assumptions that <laughs> both things are costly. For example, yeah, sure. giving both are costly. But even just that, like. I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to bother those, but like, like just not linearity per se, but just like that. There might be a lot of utility, a lot of benefit from like the first five or ten dollars, and then oh, yeah, that's true, yeah, afterwards, exactly right. Like the violence. Anyway, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so far, the incentive is not real. I mean, the assumption is not super strong. It's simply that, yeah, um, if giving money and giving pain are both costly, yeah. and money gives you gives the agent a positive utility, pain gives a negative one, you would never do both because. You're giving two things just cancel each other out. So you could give money in the good outcome and pain in the bad outcome, but you'd never give money and pain in the good outcome together. Does that make sense? I think that's true. Right? It's not like you'd say, if you do a good job, I'll give you $100. If you do a bad job, I don't know, I'll wreck your car or something like that. You would never say, if you do a good job, I'll give you a million dollars and wreck your car. Right? That doesn't make sense. You would just give them $500,000. Okay, anyway. So this is what it comes down to is this is what I just wrote. Okay. This is A is the probability. Okay. This is one minus E and G. This is the cost of giving um, good into it. Good good outcome. Or what the offer yeah, good offer. This is the probability of the outcome. This is the cost to the principle of giving the money to the outcome. This is the participation constraint. This is the uh, agents expect each other from the good thing, from the bad thing, and then minus their other cost. And this is this last thing. What the heck is that? Yeah, this is a calculus thing, which we haven't done in this class, but you probably see. Things left on the table. Kind of yeah, yeah. So this is simply, this is to maximize. This is the same thing as maximizing this with respect to a. Okay, what do we mean by that? There's a whole little. Well, maximizing this with respect to a. Right? So let me write it down. We're doing a u g plus one minus a u b minus u a. And this thing is being maximized. Okay, so it's going to be some number, some some graph. It's a function of a. It's going to look something like that, hopefully. Okay. How do I maximize it? This is the thing which makes this larger. Well, the, we maximize it by taking the derivative. Have you seen this before? So I, I teach this class. We could spend a lot of time on this. This doesn't always work. Like sometimes taking the derivative of something. That derivative is just the slope at that point. And usually, if it's well behaved. If the function is well behaved and we make the right assumptions, the derivative equals zero it does correspond to the maximum. Not always true. Like, for example, here the derivative is zero and it doesn't, it's not a maximum. But we're making enough assumptions to make it that way. Okay. Have you seen this kind of stuff before? This is pretty, if you take an econ course, it's like week two, kind of what you do. Okay. So this is expected to. 
If I take the derivative, what's the derivative of this with respect to a? Just a just times some number. Just ug, right, exactly. So it's just like the derivative of 5x with respect to x is just 5, right? So this is just ug. What's the derivative of this? this well, I could expand this. This is going to be ub minus a times ub. The derivative of this with respect to a is what? Zero, right? This is a constant situation. What's the derivative of this with respect to, to a? Negative ub. Okay. What's the derivative of this with respect to a? Well, I don't know. We haven't specified, but... Sometimes people call it u plus v prime. That's just something that's the simple integer. Okay, and I set this equal to zero. Sometimes people call this the first order condition. Can you see this? Or I could see or something like that. First order, first order condition something means the derivative is like a first order approximation of the function at a point. By setting it equal to zero, this is one way of um, mathematically characterizing what the maximum. Does that make sense? Okay. Right. Okay, so that's where we get this. Okay, that's it. That's it. So now we just have this problem. Now we're in the world of math. That's all we're doing. Okay, so let me see if I could. Um, let's see. You just solve this problem. You just find which ug, which ub, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I can do notes in that. I think now, let's see. What am I going to do? I have this thing. See, so I have, I have this over there, right? U G minus U B plus B times A zero. And I have that's the that's this, right? That's the second constraint, the, the uh, oh, inconsistent compatibility constraint. What about this here? I can write that down. A U G minus one minus A U B minus B of A. Okay, so these are my constraints. It's a plus right on the first, between the first and second. Oh, plus. Okay. okay, now <clears throat> I'm going to try to simplify things a lot. Well, I'm going to first of all, I'm just make simplify say that I'm just going to let this be equal, meaning that we're just going to assume straight up, sometimes this, this assumption does not always hold that the utility they get will actually be equal to the u-bar. That is, you're not going to give them any more than they would have in their outside thing. Like you're just you're giving them kind of just whatever they need to just make them barely want to do your job. Okay? Makes sense? It's not like you're going to give them bonus in some sense. Okay. Set this. No, okay, so let's think. Can I simplify this mathematically? Remember, this is my objective. I want to choose the A which maximizes this, or sorry, choose UG and UB to maximize this. Okay. How can I do this? Well, you know, it's a little bit complicated, right? Because, okay, look at this here. If I choose UG and UB to maximize this, such as these constraints. Okay, I'm looking at this number. I choose my UG. If my UG increases, then this will de increase and it'll be costly, right? So you don't want to make UG too large. Simply, you don't want to make UB that large either, right? Because that'll also be costly. Have to come in. But the UG and UB will also influence the A, right? That's what I said before, right? The, the, the offer will make the person choose a different A. Like if you give them a really large UG, maybe they'll, this A will be larger. See what I'm saying? So it's kind of a complicated thing. Okay, so. If I change UG and UB, that will change the A itself, so maybe I should make A as a function of UG and UB, you seem to say? Right? Okay. Another way to think about it is, anytime you have this maximization problem, here I'm choosing UG and UB, it's always easy to change it to one something where you just choose one thing, as opposed to two things. 
Okay. And I think what I can do is, I can think, if I can make UG as a, in terms of A, that's another thing I can do. Okay? All right. If I can write UG in terms of A, UB in terms of A, then this will just be something in A. Okay, so can I do that here? Can I write UG as a function of UG UB as a function of Well, we haven't defined it yet. <laughs> but, oh, if I write it, let me write down this other one as this. So I'm just expanding that out. Okay. Think of it this way UG and UB are two numbers, and there are two equations. Which UG and UB. So I should be able to solve for UG and UB to that degree. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I can solve for UG and UB in terms of A just with these equations alone, I think. So how could I do that? I'm going to try to do it. Should be the drawing book. Uh, maybe I can just do what? UG equals. Uh, yeah, I can just do some substitution, right? Yeah. yeah. So like, I think from this I can say UG equals bigness of this side, right? UB plus B prime A. Right? From this side. So I'm just going to here so that A of UB plus B prime A plus UB plus UB plus UB plus UB. I just substituted that. That's right. Yeah? Okay, so I think I should be able to solve for UB now, right? This is a U B D C from A C U B plus A U B plus B of A plus B of A. Then we have some cancellation. So we have what? A U B from A C U B plus B of A plus B of A. I think I can put everything on one side. I get U B equals, I'm just going to give this over here, U bar plus B of A minus A B prime A. I think that's right. Okay. So What's the utility that's offered in the paper, the, the offering in the bad case is the reservation right. plus the, basically the cost, right? Of yeah, yeah. Offering that. yeah. Yeah. This is something having to do with the, the, the effort of the effort. Yeah. 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 I'm not so sure how to interpret it. B prime is like the marginal effort level, how quickly it's increasing. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about UG? I think I can, well, that's just this, right? Yeah. Just add B prime into it. So UG is just going to be U bar plus B of A minus A B prime A plus B prime A. Okay. Right. I guess this is the same. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the same as U bar. B of A plus the one that I'm saying to you. Okay. All right, I think we're okay. So I can put those back into this. So I have like the principles maximizing A of 1 minus E of this thing. What is it? U bar plus B of A plus 1 minus A. E prime of A. Okay, that's this. That's I'm just substituting the D and UG, right? Okay. Plus one minus A. Zero minus B times U of B. That's this. this sort of U of U of U of B. This is, that's what this is. And the principle is now just choosing A to maximize this thing. Now it's just the maximization of one variable, whatever those things are. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, let's see if I have that in here too. Okay, let's see. 
Oh, well, maybe I didn't write that down. Oh, yeah, there it is. This is. You let this? Yeah, this is our subject to the UG and UB in here. Okay. And then I, this, I let this be the, the profits to speak of, I think, is very good. Okay. Right. That makes sense. Okay. Now, let's see. I think now we've. Uh, Kind of getting close to the, the end in some sense. Okay, all right. What's going on? Oh, okay, let's think about this a little bit by bit. If I bring this to this side, I bring B prime A on this side, I get this. And what does this mean? Okay, UG and UB is kind of like the difference between the good and bad outcome for the yeah, agent. Okay? B prime A, what's B prime A? V of A is the effort it takes. So the effort is going to look something like this, I hope, right? Okay? It's something which increases. It's not going to be something like The effort in A is not going to go like that. This means it's easier to do with water. It increases in A. Okay? But not only does it increase, the margin increases, the rate of increase also increases. Okay, what do I mean by that? Yeah, this also increases, right? But it's a different shape than this. What does this mean? Okay, this means that going from like, this is a probability like from zero to one, remember? Going from zero to 0 0.1, I don't know, takes a fair amount of effort, but going from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 takes a little effort, less effort, right? So this is so-called like, what is it, the marginal cost, or the marginal, yeah, the marginal cost of effort is decreasing, okay? This is kind of like exercise, like it's really hard to do the first model, but the next time it's easier to, okay? So we usually assume this, why? Because we want this UG and UB to, so this is like the utility difference. This is the V prime of A. This is the difference, kind of the rate at which it's increasing. Okay, we're saying that if this is large, then we want A to increase. Okay, so there's UG and UB is kind of how severe the incentive is. UG and UB are really far apart. Means there's a big difference between success and failure. And we're speaking of that will make our effort increase. Okay, the way that makes it happen is that if this is large, we want V prime also to increase. We want the derivative to increase. Okay, so therefore, if we had this, the derivative is actually decreasing. Yeah? So therefore, we want the derivative to increase, which means that the slope has to increase, which means you have this and not that. Does that make sense? So that's a very common assumption, and it's sort of it's, it's sort of reasonable. So the way to think about it is I'm kind of the, the, the principle creates effort through this mechanism. The, the more you push apart UG and UB, the greater the amount of effort you have. If you're the principle, though, why would you not want to make UG? So why would you, if I make UG and UB really far apart, that seems to be good, right? A will increase, which is good for me. Why would I not want to do that? Thing? There's more effort, it's more of a cost. Yeah, exactly, right. If UG increases, maybe that's a little impact, but it's a distance. Right? Okay, so. You know, I can say, yeah, if you do a really great job, I'll give you $10 million, but I don't want you. That's very costly. Thank you. Similarly, you can make UB really negative, but it can be like, it's really very, very costly kind of thing to give you that much pain. Makes sense? So that's kind of a trade-off. You want to make those, you, the, the principal wants to be the difference large, but not too large that becomes so expensive to give. But then the other side is, remember that if you give, make the difference large, You'd actually make, make it, for example, if you, by making UB more negative, you might make it more costly if you, had to, if you have to give it, but the probability of giving it might go smaller too. So these kind of competing things. Anyway, so those are the kinds of things you have to figure out. Okay. So then it becomes a pure math problem, but um, what I did is I can just do it um, like in a computer, which makes things easy. Okay, so let me see. This is my. One little. Okay, so and this this is you can do this in R or whatever. I'm doing Mathematica because this is what I learned. Um, I pay two hundred dollars a year just to be able to use this thing. That's <laughs> <laughs> my entire life since I was in graduate school. Like, but I've, I mean, I've gotten a lot of useful. Out of it. I don't want to. Yeah, there's a bit. Exactly right. <laughs> anyway, so what's going on? <laughs> Uh, 
Maybe they're bigger. What is this? This is simply what I wrote down before. This is my UG and UB as a function of A. Okay, that's what I... That's this. Okay, I solved for it. So UG is right. U bar plus V of A plus... Well, yeah, that's this, right? When I say U, U prime. Right, is that right? U G is A, U bar plus V of A. Plus one minus A to the B. Plus U B, U bar plus V of A. Minus A to the B prime. Okay, so that's just, that's my math. That's not computer. <laughs> that's something which I did with paper and pencil. Okay, so let's do an example of V of A. So this is, a, this is an example of V of A. What is this? Remember, this is the disutility of effort. It's how costly effort is for the agent. I plot it. Remember, effort goes from zero to one. It's the probability of a good, of a good thing happening. It looks like this. Why does it look like this? Okay, I, I chose this function. Well, first of all, it makes sense it has to increase, right? It's not like you, life gets easier the more work you work. It gets harder and harder. But not only that, each marginal effort is, increases too. Okay, that's because I wanted, like I wanted to say the thing, like you want to make the, by making the difference in UG and UB larger, you want to create effort to be larger. That's you kind of that. So it has, this, it's called convex. It's a convex function. It's increasing in convex. Okay. And I guess also it starts at zero, so that's not as important. For zero effort, it, it costs. So this function just happens to have that property. This also this function also gets very, very high as you approach one. If A gets close to one, then this becomes very, very large. And that's also a very common assumption to make because um, if this doesn't get by so making infinite large means that A will never be exactly one. Okay, because um, if A is exactly one, that's nothing wrong with that really, but um, you see, don't, it's just, um, there's this term called corner solution. Have you heard that term? It's like if the maximum is at the end, then you can't use countless anymore, basically. You have to think of other things. So that just makes it just makes life easier. So if it's very, very costly as you get to one, then you don't have to worry about ever maximizing why that one. Okay. All right, so this is my V of A. What does V prime of A look like? And does R know how to do this? Can you do it, take a derivative of an R? Yeah, okay, so this is addition. <laughs> if you take the derivative of that thing, this is what it looks like. Okay. Um, it just looks like this, and this also increases. Okay. All right, so the way to think about it is this. Remember V prime of, is it? V prime A is just UG minus UB. Okay, so if this, this thing is large, I choose A, which makes V prime the thing. So the difference between UG and UB is 10, then V prime A will be, you choose A, which makes V prime A 10, which is like this. Okay? If UG minus UB is small, like 5, then you would choose this. If UG minus UB is small, like this. Some sense. So this determines how your, that utility difference gets translated into effort. Okay. If UG minus UB is huge, like 100 or something, you'll get A close to 1. Okay. All right. So let me do a few cases. First case will be this. So in terms of functions, there's only really only two functions. One is my V, which I just showed you. And the other one is this E, which is the, the cost to you of making, um, giving somebody utility. Here's just some linear function, okay, which is, I guess it just could be kennel U. I just, I don't know what it could be. Maybe it's, what does that look like? It just looks like something like that. It costs zero to give the person zero. To give them like one, it costs you. Do you want to just make a U instead? Let's see, I don't know. Oh, let's do this one and then we'll see. <laughs> okay, it's just like getting person, giving somebody $10 cost for it is cost $10 to you, or $2.5 to you. Giving something negative $10 is like cost you negative $2.5. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. This is, you can think of this as like money. This is just a, a function finding the optimum. This is like a numerical maximization thing within that function. Okay, so remember my UG and UB depend on U bar and A. So you can think of U bar as a constant. So that U bar is 0.6. This is what the, the uh, principle maximizes. This is just Remember a times one of e of u plus one minus a times minus u. E that's that's the objective I had behind me. 
on graphing from A to 0 to 1. It looks like this. Maximize the problem there. So this, if this is u bar is 0.6, the maximum is around here like 0.75 or something like that. That's the F level. Then you can do fun things like I change my u bar to 0.3. This means the agent is slightly more desperate. Okay, what's going to happen? I don't know, it's hard to say. Yeah, this changes, maybe it gets a little less. No. Okay. But that's kind of what we're doing. We're seeing how it changes. And we can actually do it this way. Let's see. Does it works? Oh, maybe I should do it all over. I have to compute these things. Okay, so I'm going to read all these plots. Okay. This plot to that plot. This plot. Okay. All right, here we go. Maybe I'll do it this way. Okay. So what am I doing here? This is going to be what my optimal is the effort level. This is my incentive, but I'm giving the UG and giving the UB as a function of U bar. Okay, so what is happening here? When U bar, I think I've, the, the lower range is minus 0.5. So I'm changing, when the U bar is minus 0.5, the optimal value for the principle is 0.7 by 7. The principle gives one, if the good thing happens, gives minus 2.9 if the bad thing happens. Okay, so now I can see what happens. If U bar increases, this means the, the agent has better and better outside opportunities. What's happened to UG and UB? They're going up, right? They're going up with it, yeah? What's happening with A? Nothing. <laughs> it's a staying constant. Why is that? And you're right, so what we suspected that these two numbers, these two things are the same, that is the fact that you, the optimum is the same. Okay? Why is that? Here, so we're saying, could we just say, well, this model tells us the end. <laughs> okay, one way to think about it is this. This is surprising enough for me to get it, but the way to think about it is this. Okay, if, if U bar increases, I don't think what's changing. If U bar increases in my UB and UG, there's no, oh, you mean there's no U bar in the, yeah. in the yeah. principles. Yeah, exactly. The principle doesn't care about U bar. They just care about the A, right? If U bar increases, okay, you can just increase UB and GG the same amount. Okay? And then the, um, the A doesn't change the speed. Right? And what we think about it is because since the, 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 F, the cost of giving you an effort is sort of all linear, it doesn't really matter where you are in there. You know, as you bring increases, it's just two big points which are a little farther up. You see, they both move together. Does that make sense? Because the cost of all those things is always the same. That's my intuition. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's just the example. Okay, here we go. Oh, let's think about this. What if I change it to um, to U? None of this U force business. Let's change it to you. Now, the cost of utility is higher. What's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen with uh, my A? Okay, before it was the expectation, the, oh, sorry, the, the cost of giving U was U over 4. Okay. Now I'm going to make a straight up just plain U. What do you think will happen to this? Well, so, what will happen with A? Do you think it'll go down or up? I'm not sure myself. Um, it's cost you to give the person a utility. Um, I'm not sure. Think of an extreme case. It's extremely costly to give them anything. Like it's not you, but like a hundred times you. It should go down. Right? Yeah, I think it should go down, right. That's my guess. Let's see. Okay. Oh, did it? Yeah. It went, so the, before the optimum was like 0.7, now the optimum is like 0.6. Oh, good. <laughs> Our intuition was right. Let me, let's do this thing too.
Yeah, we, before it was 0.757, now it's 0.55. Okay. Again, but the A doesn't change with respect to U bar. All it changes is UG and UB. So okay. going back to, I guess, the slavery example, as it becomes more costly to engage in kind of violence, right. the amount of effort that they're going to do is going to come down. Right? So I guess so, yeah, yeah. But, okay, yeah, exactly. So trying to back to this, this is what, this thing, this, expect, this expenditure for you, this is not what I would consider the slavery thing. This is kind of a straightforward fine kind of thing, right? Because giving somebody negative utility actually has a negative cost to you. You actually want to like give them a fine. So this is kind of like, yeah, giving somebody minus 100 costs you minus one something. So, what is what was sort of the, what would the pain thing correspond to? So here, like yeah, giving somebody negative utility, right? These so are negative costs. Yeah, price. it would go kind of back up again. Yeah, yeah exactly. So this is, this is what I just sort of the normal case, and this is the standard principal agent model right here. What I'm giving you, okay, that's the normal thing. Okay, we'll do that the slavery example or thing later. Okay, so yeah, at least our little intuition about costs is good. That's good. So that's not bad. <laughs> we already have a nice result. That's the whole point of doing these things is just like changing things around, seeing what happens to them. You know, the, the thing. Okay, how about this? Now I'm going to change my um, cost for giving you. Now what is this? This this looks like this. So it's not going up or negative. So it's still kind of. It doesn't cost you anything to get paid. It actually gives you negative cost, but it's it's increasing still, right? But it, it has a shape, it's not linear, okay? In particular, giving somebody a really high utility gets more and more expensive, okay? So you kind of have the reason sort of the more state more in the middle, kind of. Okay, so now let's see. If U bar is 0 0.6, so let's see. Maybe I'll go from zero to zero point. Zoom in a little bit. Let's do this. Yeah, okay, so that's... That's that. Let's see if it goes. If, zero, if u bar is 0 0.3. Okay, now let's guess. Okay, this is where the person has relatively good outside opportunities. Effort level is 0.35 or something. If you give them worse alternatives, what do you think? What do you think the graph will look like? Will, will the A go down or up? Mm -hmm. If they have worse alternatives, they're kind of more desperate. And then you think that A will go up? See, it depends, right? Because like, if there were worse alternatives, it's like the, the principal can give make UG and UB lower, right? Both lower because you don't have to get them as high. Right? If if U bar is very high, you have to make both UG and UB high to make the whole thing worth the while. If U bar is lower, you can make UG and UB lower. But also, you've got to make that difference large enough to make that up, make it A, which, you, which is good for you, right? So it kind of, it's not clear. Let's just see what happens. What do you think? I don't know. Let's <laughs> take a guess. My guess is that A will increase the desperation thing. I don't know. Does it increase? Maybe a little bit, yeah. Here the, 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 uh, the optimus here and the blue down. Okay, so let's see what does this look like. If I do this. This is A, U, G, and U, B as a function of U bar. Okay. Now look, if, yeah, if U bar is U negative 0.5, both, you can give them both a negative U, G, and U, B. As U bar increases, okay, then U, G is positive and U, B is negative. And as U bar increases more than you have to. But so I think as U bar increases, yeah, A decreases, right? Is there, can we also have a, is there a way to just quickly plug in a variable for the difference between UG and UB? Oh, I'm just curious, sure. if, like with the relationship of the, as we've, been, as we've been talking about the difference between the offers as a function of U bar. Oh, so what do you want to change, sir? Not change, but just like, like uh, how, how, does, how does the difference between UG and UB change as a function? Oh, I see. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, just, oh, just like literally, just show the G U G minus U B. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Let's put that in there. Oh, I see. I. Oops. U G minus. 
böyle CB minus okay let's see all right okay so this is Michelle's UG minus UV as U bar increases the difference becomes smaller right so as the, the agents um, outside churns get better they're less desperate you use a less high power incentive okay. this gets lower and also when you think about it remember we have this right as UGB and minus UB get smaller because we have the assumptions of U prime A A also gets smaller right okay that's cool interesting okay so that's not too bad okay so now this is the thing which is corresponds to the violence thing which is kind of like what I was, we were talking about this is just a quadratic function this is the other way. Instead of going down like this, to give somebody maybe two, they actually cost you something. And then this is very non intuitive. I first gave this paper when I was in graduate school. And I remember sometimes I give it in confidence, people say, like, violence, how could that possibly be part of economics? Even though obviously there's, we've had slavery and stuff like that, like you know, forced labor, child labor, all these things. Intuitively, it does seem odd, weird that you would do something, anyone would do something which is hurting both people, right? Why would I ever do something which hurts me and you? And this is one of the one of the justification, which is if I want to, if I care about getting you to do something, I want to make the difference to you and you be large, which makes me actually want to spend money to make you be low, possibly. Okay. Anyway, so this what does this look like? Okay. That's this. Oh, this is book. I'll bring it to a bit. Zoom in a little bit. Okay, that's what it looks like. If now, if U bar goes to 0.3, what's going to happen, do you think? Is A going to go down to max A or down or up? So U, U bar is 0.6. Now we're making U bar 0.3. The person gets more desperate. Is the effort level going to go up or down? I don't know. It went before. It went up before? I don't remember. remember. It went down before? Let's see what happens. It actually went up, right? That's what happened last time, I think, right? Yeah, as you get more desperate, you make the UG and UB minus. Okay, let's do this too now. So, and it, um, uh, it's more sensitive to, A is more sensitive to changes in U bar with this. Oh yeah, yeah, it's interesting too, right? Yeah, perhaps yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, yeah, you could say, yeah, that um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, and with this cost function, yeah, that yeah, there's a more changes more in U bar. That's just I didn't even thought about that. It's like you're saying how much the a changes with U bar in these are different scenarios. Right. So like presumably if you had a, a steeper um, exponential function, then that would be even more so. Oh, maybe so. Yeah. Who are, you know, really, really tight. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I'm fine with that. Okay, yeah, that's still. We can try that out next. Okay, let's see, let's see this. Yeah. What's going on here? Okay, U bar is minus 0. 0.5. Okay, so what's going on here? U G is positive, U B is negative. This means this corresponds to violence being used. Okay, this is something where the in some probability, I guess probably 0.4, if A is a probability success, probably fills is 0.4. The, the, the principal spends money to make the agent worse off. As U bar increases, okay, what happens? Okay, both, so I think A is decreasing, less effort even used. Both UG and UB are increasing. The quality of the incentive gets a little smaller. And as U bar increases, Actually, now UB power pops above zero. Okay, and so the idea is whether violence is used depends on U bar. So that's kind of the punchline of this paper, with enough assumptions. And of course, it might not work with other assumptions. You know, I assume this particular V and you know this stuff. But the paper tries to make those assumptions kind of clear. What's the punchline? The punchline is like um, in the Industrial Revolution, why were children beaten up in factories, but adults weren't? They did almost the same thing. They did this thing with looms and all that stuff in, in the UK. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like, that's the birth of the Industrial Revolution in the United Kingdom. So, yeah, children... better, right? Like, weren't children even preferred in some cases? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I, like, I think, I 
No, no, no. It was like a nationwide thing. That was even one of a lot of the reasons we know about this period is because there's a government inquiry and like conditions for children in you know um, factories and this is kind of that time period where they sort of have you know schools for children and all that stuff. And so um, it's really kind of one of the births of the progressive movement is this stuff. Anyway, in these factories, you know these looms and stuff. Children were like they had small fingers, so they're really good at like doing these small things with the things. Um, it, and they're very valued employees. Um, but adults did those things too. However, adults were not beaten up, whereas kids were routinely. Why is that? The model says it's because kids had a lower U bar. That's all. For, for an adult to walk out of a job, they could probably get another job. But if your kid walked out of a job, you probably have to go home, and your parents will also like, you know, mistreat you or punish you, something like that. Does that make sense? So this is also like. Um, um, you know, you would say that like something like slavery, something like violence or relationship, labor relationships, isn't just about violence. It's about the underlying choices you have to get out of it. In some sense, right? So you would say that what's really about about slavery isn't so much the fact that violence is used in the labor relationship, but rather the fact that you cannot leave it. Does that make sense? And I mean, even in the paper, I even make an analogy toward like women's shelters for like violence. So that when I wrote it in 1990, you know better women's shelters was still kind of a thing, like a new thing was just being, it was considered an innovation at the time. So a lot of people were saying like, what, is, what do better women's shelters do? Because they're not addressing the root problem of violence, which is this violent you know, spouse or something like that. It's an exit option. Right, it's just an exit option, pure, pure and simple, right? So the idea is if you have a big, better exit option, then, then your spouse doesn't have, no longer has the incentives in some sense you know, to use violence, simple as that. You know, so um, if you look at like, how people thought about domestic violence, it's kind of like a history of social science theories. <laughs> you know, like, um, a lot of the people who originally worked on um, violence in the family were temperance people, like women's temperance union people. And so they very much influenced, thought it was all about alcohol. So that was actually getting rid of alcohol. And uh, one big sub-argument or subtext was stopping family violence, actually, in, in the United States at least. And then another kind of, uh, Influential thing was systems theory and sociology. There was this idea that like everything's a system, and if something goes wrong in the system, it's because the system's messed up. So like, so the idea is that there's fam there's violence in the family. That must mean that the family system is messed up, which means that you know the wife should be a better wife, basically. And so it was really a messed up kind of thing. But that people people said that because they were influenced by sociological theories and stuff. And um, you know, still you have some of that idea today. Or even more, I mean, even like relatively more benign versions of it, which is like people, um, like that that's a despair argument about like social ills or whatever, like oh, yeah. because people are losing their jobs. Right, yeah, absolutely right, exactly right. perfectly clear, not, a, not my explanation for what- Yeah, exactly, exactly right. Stuff, but yeah. I'm sure it doesn't help. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Anyway, so that's what's nice about this game theory stuff is that it makes super clear what the options are and the, and the choices, right? So you can say this is, maybe those things also are relevant. I mean, who might have saved? And some people take a family violence in almost a medical way, like aggression or something like that. But I, to me, violence is clearly not just about aggression. You know, like violence of slavery is a system. It's not like about individual people, a, bunch, a lot of individual people getting upset or something like that, right? It's clearly a systematic thing. It's a structure. So, um, you know, this makes it very clear how violence is, you know, depends again on the underlying situation, in particular, the outside option of the person. Right, so, um, so that, that was the idea, at least. So, um, yeah. So, that's what I was pushing. But if you <laughs> if you look at the principal agent literature, there's lots of other things like this. So, there's lots of ways you can think about it. And it's all about how this UG and UB you know, might depend on things. In this particular thing, I was focusing my very much on how to affect it on a new bar. But you could do other things like how it changes with E or something like that. Like we could, you were saying, we could change things around, like. Or the functional form of. Uh, yeah. Let's see. It's instead of this E, maybe I'll make E larger. I'll just make it, yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so now let's do this thing too. Okay, so now compared to here, well, I'll bring this U bar back to five. Oh, actually, it might not be, they might, oh. It thinks it's the, it resets to the old one. 
let me see, I have to, I have to, sorry. Every time I put an e, another e in, e in there, okay, sorry. Oh, let's just use these graphs. So, so okay, these are the, the okay. Well, I'll, I'll do this way. Okay, that's the old e. Oh. Huh. I guess I should play. Yeah, it's going to move when I change the thing. So as soon as I do this, it's going to. It's good. Those numbers are going to change. I think. Oh, it did. Okay, it's good. Okay, yeah. Let's look compared. Mm -hmm. You know, if you use more expensive, yeah, the effort level is lower. But I think it's because it's, it's more expensive to give that difference, right? It's more expensive to make the UG and UB difference large. So therefore, you make it smaller. So the effort level. Let's see, how about, okay, when does UB become zero, okay? So this is like the transition to, okay, so when E is expensive, then when U bar is 1.46, then we transition to, to no violence. Okay, what if E is cheaper? When does that transition take place? Should it happen earlier or later? I'm thinking earlier. earlier. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Okay, now let's do that. Looks like it's going to be later. <laughs> okay, this is corresponds to your about point two three nine eight. Yeah, it actually happens later. <laughs> now what's going on there? This means if it's costlier to give someone punishments and wages, remember it, the, instead of e of u before it looked like this, now it's looking like this. Okay. Now it's saying that it's more into this situation. Hold on, I'm getting all confused. This was, this is, you know, this one, which is the expensive, which is, this is the expensive, this is the right? right? right. And they're expensive, it, you transition here. Oh, no, this makes sense, right? Expensive means that it's more likely we won't use violence, right? Any you borrow over this will have, right? Any you borrow over from one for six above will have no violence. Right. If, 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 if giving utility expensive. If it's cheap, any you borrow point three nine eight is kind of give no hmm? Yeah, right. Okay, yeah. If you bar is if, if E is expensive, then this region corresponds to violence. If E is is cheap, then this larger region corresponds to violence. I think that's right. I'm a little turned around once again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> Alright, I think what happened looks okay. This car this one corresponds to this is where This is why we have models. <laughs> so you don't, you don't get confused so much. Because it's easy to get confused. It's, it's not. It's very normal to get confused. Okay, let's see. Going back. Okay, I think you said. So if E of U is U squared over 4, then this is U bar. That's, that's this one, right? This is where UB is going to be. This is the violent region, right? The transition point. When e is u is u squared without the force, then the transition happens at one one four six. Yeah. And so the violent, the region of violence is low. That makes sense. So yeah, if it's costlier to give violence, they double the time. It matters if we also like. 
Yeah, if we could change the other side too. We could change it. Up. Yeah. Right. One of the yeah. So this is like this. This is like this. And maybe we could do something like like this. <laughs> right. You could do that. You know, maybe, you know. So this is like very conducive to the time. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. What is it right now? I don't know. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So I think it's you know worth an hour and twenty minutes of time or whatever. You know, from first principles, we kind of you know realized you know we we have the simple model you know of no uncertainty at all that works for a lot of cases, but definitely will not work for violence. Will definitely not work for something which the cost depends on whether it works or not, right? So then you're left down this road, but then this road is not that hard a road. I mean. It was a road which no one in the world went down in 1960. No, this road don't, did not exist until like Holmes and Milgram created that road in like 1980 or something like that. Um, but it exists, and now you can say something with it. So, so anyway, when people talk about principal agent, this is the model. There are other versions of it, but they're all kind of the same. They all have the same feature of um, of, um, of these constraints. You're maximizing something special to constraints. That's basically it. All right, thanks. Okay, so next, tomorrow, I guess I'll just keep up, try to come up with things. But let me know if there's things you want to talk about. And um, I have a lot of fun things to talk about, but you know, whatever. Just let me know if you have any preferences. Or... I know we're over, but what's the story with the, the publication you mentioned? Oh! That's or is a, that, is it? No, it's a fun story. Okay. Okay, yeah. yeah. I could also, we could also do it, I don't know. Yeah, well, I'll tell you. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'll do it. It's, it's not that long, but it's, I enjoy telling it, so. <laughs> All right. But okay, oh, we'll do it Thursday, thanks.